foothills of South Central Florida. This is Far Out Radio. I'm Scott Teeters, and today is Friday. It's August the 15th, 2014. I hope you had a nice day and are ready for some Far Out Friday night fun, Frizzell style. Yes, Bob Frizzell is back with us this evening. Bob has been with us many times in the last year or so, and we're happy to inform you that we are catching up with our YouTube archives project so you can access all of bob's previous visits this year by going to faroutradio.com and on the right hand side look for the far out radio archive shows on youtube graphic and click when you arrive at the next page on the uh, youtube channel homepage, click on the playlists link and you'll find bob frizzell's playlist and we invite you to subscribe to our youtube channel so that you can keep up when, when new programs are added. Obviously, we like far-out topics here on this program. When I discovered Bob's book in 1996 titled, Nothing in This Book is True, But It's Exactly How Things Are, I said, this is far-out stuff, man. <laughs> I just could not put the book down. And it opened up my head to a whole new realm of topics and understandings. Now, Bob's work pulls together a lot of very out there topics, including ancient history, secret government, the Hall of Records, our light body, the Great Pyramid, the Lucifer Rebellion, the Anunnaki and the Nephilim, and believe it or not, much, much more. Now, I use the material covered in Bob's books to as a launching pad to further my self-education, and there's so much material covered that if you take it and run, you'll be expanding your mind, man, for a long, long time. Now, back in 2010, Bob published a revised, updated, and expanded edition of Nothing in This Book is True, but it's exactly how things are. And you can get a signed copy of the book on Bob's website, bobfrizzell.com, and his last name is spelled F-R-I-S-S-E-L-L. Plus, there's a Kindle version on Amazon for just $7.77. You can't beat that price. And uh, also, if you go to his website, you can enjoy a nice collection of YouTube bo- videos with Bob. Now, when Bob was with us two weeks ago, we talked about ancient Sumeria. What an amazing story and a mystery. This incredible civilization sprung up from seemingly nowhere 6,000 years ago and then quickly disappeared, not only from the landscape, but from our collective memory, thanks to the burning of the Library of Alexandria, followed by the transformation of the Holy Roman Empire into the Holy Roman Catholic Church. They didn't like that stuff, so... They stopped talking about it, and we all forgot about it. But one of the central characters in this ancient story is an interesting fellow named Foth. He's such a prominent figure that uh, we wanted to bring Bob back with us tonight to tell us about this fascinating fellow. So, hi, Bob. Welcome back to the program. Yeah, hi, Scott. Uh, Good to be back on, and uh, thanks for having me again. Looking forward to talking about Foth. You're you're quite welcome. You know, Bob, i got to tell you that... uh, when word got out uh, that you were going to be on the program tonight, the studio audience started arriving hours ago. I mean, they were really excited to, <laughs> to see you and be with you this evening. So they're all here tonight. So how about a nice round of applause for our guest, Bob Frizzell. <laughs> all right. Okay. All right. Thanks. All right. Sit down. Sit down, everybody. Okay. All right. All right. Let's okay. let the guests do some talking here. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, oh. Well, they're all here, Bob. We're all ears. And hey, tell us about this Thoth story as you understand it, because it, it came through another interesting fellow named Drunvalo Melchizedek. So yeah. before we dive into Thoth, why don't you tell us a little bit about this Drunvalo uh, fellow, because his story, as far as I'm concerned, is equally as fascinating. Oh, absolutely. No question about it. Yeah, so two main characters here, Drunvalo and Thoth, well, uh, for me, uh, this began, I first met Drunvalo in June of 1992, uh, 22 years ago, and I met him out of a burning desire, actually a burning desire that, that's never left me. Uh, I, uh, I discovered some, some really incredible information in, in 1988. I had been uh, the, a teacher of breath work ever since 1980, but when I began to work with a man by the name of Jim Leonard in 1988, frankly, I learned more in one weekend from him than I had learned in the previous eight or nine years combined. And I'm going 
wow, this is really good. And I made the decision at that moment that I want to know what this guy knows. And so for me, that just meant mastering the information, which I proceeded to do. And in the course of doing that, not only did my life change dramatically for the better, trans- transform would be a much better way of putting it, I was able to heal myself of a, of a back injury that uh, curtailed my bowling career and just about everything else in my life, too. So I was really pleased. But through the combination of this burning desire and, and along with that, following my passion, I, I gave mastering this information everything I, can, everything I could. It, 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 it was what it was about for me, period. But in the course of doing that, I began to realize that in spite of all what I'm learning here, there is actually more information that I need to become aware of. And uh, this was about the early 1990s. It began to pop open in 1990, it began to accelerate in 1991. Now, I didn't have any idea what this missing information was, but I realized that didn't matter that I had the entrance requirement, and that was the burning desire to continue until I just found out what it was. And I also realized that out of that 100% intention, i.e. burning desire, that magic would begin to happen. Literally, people would start crawling out of the woodwork and giving me, feeding me exactly what I needed to know in the moment. Maybe we would only have a conversation that would last for five minutes or so, and maybe I would never see them again. But it didn't matter. Some I became good friends with, some it was literally five minutes, and that's it. Uh, But that sort of magical thing just kept happening. That's how I was introduced to the UFO phenomenon. I never really given it a thought hardly before that. Bob, and, the what uh, phenomenon? The UFO thing. UFO. Oh, UFO, okay. Yeah, UFOs and the ETs and, 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 all, and all that goes with that. And little did I realize that that was opening the door for something much greater to come in. And again, this burning desire. Well, in the course of all of this, Sometime in about 1991, I linked up with a group of like-minded people here in the San Francisco Bay Area, about 20 to 30 of us, and we would have monthly meetings, just opening our house to uh, invite everybody in to just spend an evening sharing videos, discussion, books, you name it, and uh, with with our common mindset. And so, I've done out of this, kind of things, it's a lot of fun. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, a study group, when, a, when you get a group of like-minded people together, we were not only having a lot of fun, but uh, just sharing some fantastic information. And so it was out of that that one day I got a letter in the mail that was telling me about uh, an event that uh, I, I took one look at this letter and I realized that I had to be there. It was talking about this guy by the name of Thoth, who's been around and alive for 52,000 years, which didn't strike me as odd at all because I had been studying this sort of thing. And, uh, and it was talking about ascension. It was talking about the possibility of how to turn your body into light and change your conscious wavelength and move literally into a different level of existence. And I am just sitting there going, wow, i got to be there. Beware. Well, it went on to talk about a 30-hour presentation, not live, but on video. And uh, when I showed up in San Mateo on this June 1990 noon afternoon, that was my introduction to Drunflow. And uh, so he spent 30 hours talking about Thoth and UFOs and ETs and Ascension, (laughs) sacred geometry and unity and and all of that stuff. And uh, at, at about... I don't think it took me more than about five minutes into that presentation. The initial five minutes was all I needed to go, wow, I want to know what this guy knows. <laughs> I made the same decision I had made four years earlier with, with Jim Leonard. And you and, knew you uh, were in the exact right place. Yeah, yeah, it was, just, it was just perfect. Just like four years ago, the whole thing was recreating itself with exactly the missing information that I had to add, add to my understanding. And so... Uh, and so here we go again. And really out of that, you know, uh, people think I set out to write a book. 
nothing could be further from the truth. I, I wrote a book because I was asked by my publisher to write a book. We became friends as a result of his coming to me for a series of uh, breathwork sessions and discovered that we had a common link, a guy by the name of Richard Hoagland, who was uh, the author for The Monuments on Mars, and guess who the publisher was? So you know the answer. And uh, and one of the many things Drunvalo was talking about was Mars and all that was going on in there. So that was our common link. So the guy calls me up one day and says, hey, how about you writing a book? I'm going, well, okay, here we go. So uh, so much came so much came out of that initial thirty hours, and uh, including my following through on the decision that I had made to continue uh, the mastery I had developed with Jim Leonard, and to and to allow Drunvalo also to become an integral part of my life. Well, from that I got not only wrote the book and two others, but also got trained by Drunvalo himself uh, to to lead a workshop called The Flower of Life, which I've been giving for, for 22 years. So we can go on and on with that, but uh, one of the central characters to come out in all of this was this man by the name of Thoth, this guy who's been around and alive and in various bodies for, for 52,000 years. By the way, the same guy that we talked about in our last session, and probably in the last uh, uh, program or two before that also, when we were talking about 13,200 years ago, really in the attempt to solve the disaster that was created in Atlantis, uh, Thoth stepped forward along with two of his ascended master buddies, a man by the name of Ra, another by the name of Ara Argot, and they proceeded to uh, create the Great Pyramid 13,200 years ago in Atlantis, and from there, creating ultimately 83,000 sacred sites on the fourth dimensional level. Then we talked about, over the course of 13,000 years, how through intuition, inspiration, or what have you, people were guided to recreate these structures on the third dimensional level, all of which had the purpose of, uh, of altering dramatically, consciously, the energy on the surface of the planet, which was uh, enabling the successful creation of an electromagnetic energy field, i.e. a grid, a consciousness grid, 60 miles above the Earth. A grid that is enabling a new level of awareness, a new level of humanity at the proper moment to step forth. So, uh, you suppose that'll give us something to talk about today? Yeah, before we dig into the <laughs> into Thoth and who he is and you know what he's been yeah. up to all these many years. Yeah, uh, right. Dr- <laughs> many, many years. Uh, Drunvalo is um, uh, he's one of those unique, unusual people that is referred to as a walk-in, uh, yeah. which definitely uh, sort of gets you to the head of the line or, or way up there. Uh, yeah. Briefly for our audience that might not be familiar with that, because it's really fundamental to who he is. Uh, just explain to, to us you know, what a walk-in is and uh, what Drunvalo's experience uh, of being a walk-in was like. Mm-hmm, sure. Well, that actual experience, he says, happened on April 10th, 1972, when he walked into the body of a man by the name of Barod, uh, Bernard Perone. Now, the question is, well, what is a walk-in? And in order to, to begin to get some clarity on that, I think we need to understand, oh, yeah, there's, there's just a lot of things that, that need to come forth here. One being that, uh, uh, holy cow, where do you begin? I could say that nothing is as it appears to be. That certainly is a true statement. And uh, could also add to that that in order to be here on this third dimensional level, and prior to that we talked about how in Atlantis and uh, before that in Lemuria, we were actually experiencing reality uh, with with many more of the veils lifted, if you will. But as a direct result of that fall 13,000 years ago, literally a fall in consciousness, and we talked about how we had to start over because our memories were erased, the memories of Atlantis and who we were, all of that was gone. So you're talking about starting over at square one. 
which is really the same thing as saying that when you're starting over, there's an enormous number of veils that are placed upon you, fundamentally including the understanding of who you are. And we've almost 100% bought into the idea, hook, line, and thinker of who we aren't and become our mind. But uh, there's much more to life than uh, thinking you are who you aren't. And one of the understandings that I want to bring forth here is that uh, you and I are eternal. We've been around ever since the very beginning, and we will be around until the very end if there is such a thing. That death as we know it is a total incomplete illusion. That the true self, the spirit, never dies. And that's what I mean when I say we've been around from the beginning and around till the end. Furthermore, uh, as the eternal spirit uh, 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 in various forms, sometimes we've been in form, sometimes we have not been in form. We've been to the top of the level of, of, of awareness, and we've been at the bottom of the barrel, which is pretty much where we are right now. My understanding of it is this, that you just keep going up until you reach the top, and then, hey, just for the heck of it, you come on back down and, uh, and get to do it all over again. So, so that begins to shed a little light on what a walk-in is. That, Bob, uh, Bob, I'm curious. How do you mean that people in, a, in our distant past were living with fewer veils? I mean, what would that have been like? I mean, somebody knocks on your door, you go up and you answer the door. I mean, did, did the spirit just sort of float in and say, hey, Bob, hey, listen, you got a minute? I mean, what okay. What would that That's so foreign to, to our regular you know, pedestrian consciousness that it's almost like, uh, huh? Yeah, I, I, I certainly agree with that. And uh, that, that is something I was planning on, on getting into in some, in some detail today. But okay. first, before, before we go there, let's just see if we can uh, put, put a little more into uh, uh, a more, little more clarity into this whole idea of a walk-in. So, uh, so considering that uh, uh, Drunvalo walked into his body on April 10th, 1972, he came from a level of awareness called Melchizedek that pretty much is as, as cream rises to the top, so does consciousness. So does spirit in its internal eternal manifestation. So it's a very very high level of awareness relative to us, and uh, and so it's from that level he claims that he actually uh, came into this body, not with all the memories. You, you, you just couldn't be here and have the veils completely lifted, but with more perhaps than than uh, the average Joe, to put it that way, and. Uh, and in addition to that, he had the, the additional advantage of having this guy, Thoth, this 52,000-year-old guy, uh, 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 as a teacher for about seven or eight years. So Thoth helped him greatly with the memories of the earth and, uh, and uh, also the understanding of just what it's like to be on, on this level of awareness. So that perhaps doesn't completely cover the whole thing of being a walk-in. But uh, to kind of get to your question now about having more of the veils lifted when, the, uh, when we were in Atlantis and prior to that in, uh, in, um, in Lemuria, uh, uh, we talked, I think, probably in our very first show, that would have been a bit more than a year ago, mm-hmm. of all the different dimensional levels and how they're separated by wavelength. And that really, each one is, well, everything is a function of consciousness, but that as you move up the dimensional level, the wavelength becomes shorter, the frequency higher, and uh, the level of understanding tends to increase for beings that are on the higher dimensional level, like, say, the fourth dimensional relative to us, they have a much greater understanding experientially speaking, of who they are, what this reality is, how to manifest and uh, how to manifest virtually anything they want, and how to travel interdimensionally and just all sorts of good things. And, uh, and uh, when you get down to the level of where we are, because we fell down here 13,000 years ago and had to basically start at the beginning, 
these memories are just lost. I mean, you know, there's no way a caveman is, is, is what, even if he did know how to travel interdimensionally, what the heck good would it do him when he doesn't even, when he hardly even knows what fire is, you know? So when you have to start over, you literally are doing that. And we talked about how the Sumerian culture and the Egyptian culture both came out about roughly 5,800 years ago, and uh, that for us was, was starting over. So, uh, but if you go back to the times in Atlantis and prior to that when our memories were not lost, we, many, many, many things were different about us. Uh, number one, we were on a higher dimensional level. We were somewhere in the fourth dimension. So just by that fact alone, we would have a greater understanding. But we were not in a separate state like we are right now, a separate state of awareness. We're cut off from the rest of reality. We're not really, but we've convinced ourselves that we are, separate from looking out at a world that's not really us. Back in the days of Atlantis, we were in harmony, we were in unity. And one way of looking at that is that not only were we in unity with our, with our mother, Mother Earth, so we weren't standing apart trying to conquer, trying to control, uh, but we had a much different way also of accessing memory. We were literally on a different level of consciousness. And it's perhaps uh, easier to understand when we talk about how we access memory. There were no secrets. What was available to one was available to all. Uh, that uh, the Atlanteans had this, what uh, we refer to as a holographic memory. So that, for example, our conversation, if we were in the days of Atlantis, would be available to everybody, to anybody who wanted it. That any Atlantean could recreate holographically you sitting in your room, me sitting in my room, the whole discussion that's going on in total, complete detail. And so that's 100% recall. And that's the kind of memory that we used to have on this level of awareness. And uh, yeah. which obviously we, we do not have anything remotely approaching that. In, I think in metaphorically these days we call that having a photographic memory. Bob, we've got music playing in the background, so we're going to take our break. If you're just joining us for this Far Out evening on Far Out Radio on a Friday night, Bob Frizzell is with us. And you can keep up with Bob's work at his website, bobfrizzell.com. He's got inspiring articles and he's got a nice collection of uh, YouTube videos that you can watch. Plus, you can purchase uh, uh, all of his five books, eight audio CDs, and three DVDs right there. It's bobfrizzell.com, and we'll be right back. And welcome back to Far Out Radio. If you're just joining us on this Friday evening, we are having some far out fun uh, exploring the fringes of reality with our friend Bob Frizzell. Okay, Bob, uh, let's uh, continue our conversation with Drunvalo. I think you had a few more things you wanted to cover before we get into Thoth. Oh, there's just so much more to cover. <clears throat> uh, well, I, uh, I uh, think the... Uh, a very important point with regard with regard to who we were uh, uh, prior to uh, the the fall of Atlantis has pretty much been made. There's actually there's there's much much more to that that uh, at some point we'll get into. And uh, but um, I. I, I think a, a, a good place to go right now would be to just start introducing Thoth, the Egyptian, a little bit. But in order to do that, we have to go back about 70,000 years to the last thousand or a couple thousand years or so of Lemuria. And at that time, roughly 70,000 years ago, there was a couple by the name of Ai and Taye, and they learned how to stay alive. They learned how not to die. And they did it in a what would seem to be a rather unusual way, and that is by having a baby in what we would consider to be a rather unusual way. Uh, interdimensional mating, immaculate conception, I mean, that sort of thing. They did not mate in the way that we know. But as a result of doing that, the three of them uh, just kept on living. They became the first immortal beings. And those guys are still alive today. And uh, not necessarily meaning that they're in the same body as they were back in Lemuria, but their memory 
has remained intact for all these 70 plus thousand years. Never ever again will they have a break in memory. So I mean, if you can imagine the obvious advantage in being able to keep your memory together for 70,000 years, yeah, you might uh, have learned a thing or two and learned to avoid a few mistakes here and there. So as a result of discovering this, they decided eventually that it would be a good idea to share their wisdom, teaching it to others, and so they opened a school called the Nicole Mystery School, spelled in double A C A L, and uh, it was the it became the first mystery school to teach the great mysteries of life, and they were pretty good teachers because in the course of about a thousand years. They taught roughly a thousand people. It would have been more like 999 because they all were in groups of three: the mommy, the daddy, and the and the offspring, all stepping into immortality. And they were the first ascended masters. So roughly about a thousand of them. So they were they were also known as the Nicals. And they, the Nicals, are instrumental in the founding of Atlantis when uh, Lemuria finally sank. And, uh, and, uh, I mean, extremely instrumental. And furthermore, living amongst the Atlanteans. So it must have been extremely interesting times to have these extremely advanced beings relative to the rest of the Atlanteans just uh, living, living amongst them. So it was out of this first group of a thousand or so ascended masters that, uh, Thoth's parents came along. His father's name was Thome. And I don't know if I ever knew what Thoth's mother's name was, but considering that his parents were immortal, you might say, well, you know, the guy had a pretty good head start. Uh, <laughs> but he still had to figure it out for himself. We're talking about Thoth now. And he did 52,000 years ago. How to stay alive, how to stay conscious, how to stay in one body continuously, if he so chooses, and along with that, how to turn that body into a ball of light and ascend through the heights if he chooses to do that and come back and step back into that body any time that he wishes. Well, for the most part, for 52,000 years, Thoth stayed back in, in, in that body and acted as, as a teacher much more directly than most of the other ascended masters. But uh, Thoth, now 52,000 years is a, is a long, long time to never have, a, again, a break in memory. For much of that time, uh, he was uh, in Atlantis. And in fact, for 16,000 years, he was the king of Atlantis. During the times of Atlantis, his name was Chikutet Arlich Vomolite. So he's gone through different names, too. Actually, his name was Arlich Vomolite because... I'm sorry, what did you say? I said, easy for you to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Uh, actually, his name was Arlage Vomolite because Chikutet is a title, and what Chikutet means is the thinker, seeker of wisdom. So Arlage Vomolite uh, was around and alive for many thousands of years in Atlantis. And, of course, uh, he was very instrumental, as we shared last time, and I think the time before that, in the... Uh, you might say, the founding of the New World uh, after the fall, the Egyptian culture, and just slightly before that, the Sumerian culture. And and again, we talked about how he did his thing in Egypt and, and uh, creating the uh, ultimately the, the grid for the new level of awareness that at some point we, we will go into. So this guy has been a very, very instrumental player throughout throughout our history. So when Egypt uh, came forth, he stepped forward, and now he became known as Thoth. And uh, and uh, and in Egypt, he is known as the scribe, the one who wrote it all down, all the history that is. But much more fundamental than that, he is the one who introduced writing. Because prior to that, if you've got holographic memory, who needs writing? Who needs reading? If you've got total, complete recall, not the sort of uh, absentee-minded recall that we have, where we mm -hmm. have to struggle sometimes to remember our zip code, let alone our phone number, 
you got 100% recall, and for that reason, during the times of Atlantis, nothing was ever written down. Everything was transmitted orally, and here again, through this transpersonal memory, it worked perfectly. But uh, when Egypt and uh, the Sumerian culture came forth, uh, we lost all of that. Uh, when when the Egyptians and Sumerians began to wake up and remember, you know, the basic basically the lost knowledge of Atlantis was just given to them by the Nephilim in Egypt, excuse me, in Sumeria, and by the ascended masters in Egypt. Uh, much of the memory came back, but not all of it. More like a photographic memory, you know still pretty good compared to what we've got, but mm-hmm. not this transpersonal holographic memory. And the introduction of writing shortly thereafter, you might say, sealed our fate. So I guess we'll talk about that in our in our next segment. Sealed our fate. Okay, that's a that's a good uh, <laughs> uh, jumping yeah. off point. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, wow, I'm I'm still I'm still thinking about uh, you know total recall memory. Imagine that you know like you don't have to, you wouldn't have to do any to do list because it's all right there in your head. There you go. There you go. There you go. Okay, Bob. Not only take not only your head, but my head and everyone else's too. Yeah, that's a far <laughs> out thing to to consider. You know, like if everybody's tuned into everybody else. Um, it certainly would change how you think, knowing that everybody body. can hear what you're thinking and knows what you're thinking. It's uh, <laughs> one of those things you go, mm, I'm, I'm not sure I'm ready for that. Okay, yeah, right. well, what we are ready for is a commercial break. So we'll take our break, and we'll be right back in a few more minutes with our friend Bob Frizzell. You can keep up with Bob's work at his website, bobfrizzell.com. And we are back. Welcome back to Far Out Radio. We're spending this Friday evening with our friend Bob Frizzell, and we're we're kind of giving you the Whitman's sampler box version of Bob's book. Nothing in this book is true, but it's exactly how things are. It's a terrific book, and if you like to expand your mind, uh, there is so much material here that will just you know leave you thinking and pondering for a long, long time. It's been a long time since I read it, and I, it's one of those books I love to go back every now and then and just open it up and read a little bit and go, huh. So, all right, Bob, take it away. Yeah, okay. So, self-introduced writing, and as I suggested, that that it sealed our fate. But what I mean is that it changed the way we access memory. So that meant that we no longer had this holographic memory or nothing even remotely close to it. In addition to that, it threw us literally into a different level of consciousness, but we'll have to kind of get to that in a in a little bit here. But in order to access memory now, what we have to do is we have to go out and pull the desired information with a code, meaning a word or a concept, in order to bring back the memory of whatever it is. And then if we're lucky, we can remember maybe somewhere between 10 to 15 percent or maybe 50 percent, if we're really lucky, of what it is we're trying to, to remember as opposed to the 100% recall we had during the the days of Atlantis. But it was deemed necessary. It was considered to be absolutely necessary, and throwing us into this different level of consciousness is, is the key here. But in order to explain that, now we need to go to one of the temples in Egypt. It's called Abu Simbel. And Abu Simbel uh, has, has all these different statues of beings, And some of them are very, very tall. They're sitting in chairs, but if they were standing up, they would be 55 to 60 feet tall. Others are very tall also, but not quite so tall. They're only about 35 feet tall. And then others are, to the others, relative midgets, they're only about 14 to 16 feet tall. So what are we talking about here? And why would the Egyptians carve this into their temple at Abu Simbel, which, by the way, you can very easily reference this. Just go do a Google search search on Abu Simbel, pull out the images, and you're looking at the very thing I'm talking about here. The only thing is that not many people are able to interpret what they see. I uh, spell it either, Bob. Yeah, A-B-U, uh, two words, S-I-M-B-E-L. And to make it even more interesting, you can get some um, perspective here when you see that there are many tourists in the photographs. You know, 
opossums that are about roughly five and a half to a little over six feet tall, and we're just dwarfed by these giant statues. So what these giants, if you will, are representing is the fact that there are five different levels of consciousness that uh, that we have to understand here in order for any of this to, to really make any sense. And there is a height range associated with the five different levels. That's what they're showing you at Abu Simbel. There's a different number of chromosomes. There's a totally different way of interpreting and understanding and experiencing the reality. And uh, we got a hint of it when we're talking about the different ways of accessing memory. What I am referring to when we go back, <clears throat> excuse me, to the days of Atlantis and prior to that in Lemuria, is that we literally were on a different level of consciousness. We were on the first level of consciousness. We had fewer chromosomes. We had 42 plus 2, not 44 plus 2 like we have right now. We were a little bit shorter, maybe like 4.5 to 5.5 feet tall, and we had this holographic memory, and we had this level of unity awareness. So in other words, instead of the individual that we perceive ourselves to be right now, looking out at a world that we don't get our intimate connection to, uh, back in the days of Atlantis, we experienced ourselves much more like cells in the larger body, each contributing to the greater good of the whole. That's the idea of unity. And that's how we were able to access information from anybody and everybody, this holographic memory, if you will. But the act of introducing the writing threw us out of the first level of consciousness into the second level of consciousness, where we've got more chromosomes, we're a little bit taller, and we are in a separate state of consciousness. So we don't experience unity like we did. We experience separation. We don't have this interpersonal memory that we used to have. We, as I as we well know, have to struggle to remember our middle names sometimes, and so on and on it goes. So the question is, why did Thoth do this? Why did he introduce writing when he knew full well what it would mean? Well, we need to explain a little bit more in order for this to begin to make sense, and the first thing is to talk about the third level of consciousness which is the 10 to 16 foot height range. And these are some of the beings that are shown in the uh, at Abu Simbel. And so they have 46 plus 2 chromosomes, more than we do. They are much taller, obviously, than we are. They have a huge elongated head to house their huge brain, and they have a much expanded level of awareness. Furthermore, they're not in a separate state like we are. They are in a level of unity awareness, but it's a much, much higher level of unity than anything you can experience on the first level of awareness. And when a level three, consciousness level three being, wants to remember something, he or she, because time is spherical on that level, past, present, and future is all happening at once, all they got to do is think up the thought. It could be past, present, and future, and it's not a holographic remembering. They are there living and experiencing the real thing. So it's an upgrade from the first level in every single way. But the reason writing was introduced, the reason is it was necessary to throw us into the second level of, of consciousness is because in preparation for going from the first to the third, you can't go directly from the first to the third. You have to go through this intermediate level called us, this disharmonic level called the second level of awareness where you experience yourself as separate from, cut off from the reality, and all the rest that, 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 that goes with us that we live on a, on a daily basis. Now, you might ask, well, why was it considered necessary to ultimately get us from the first level into the third level of awareness? Well, remember, there was this disaster that was created in Atlantis that almost destroyed not only Atlantis, but the entire Earth. And it was thanks to the Ascended Masters, who were given help from higher life forms. In essence, they were given the blueprint for the plan that uh, entailed this creation of the grid. We talked about that in detail. People can access that, as you say, just by going to YouTube, and they can listen to the previous discussions we've had. And um, 
And um, so, man, I'm talking so fast here, I hardly keep up with myself. <laughs> You're doing fine. <laughs> so let, me, let me take a breath here and try and recall what I'm talking about. Uh, going from the first to the third level, passing through the second. Well, again, this disaster in Atlantis. Uh, what's the possible solution? Well, like Einstein said, uh, the, the, you cannot solve your problems with the same level of awareness that created them. So you have to find a new way to solve them. And because everything is a function of consciousness, you have to find a way to lift some of the veils, the very veils that your current level of awareness is preventing you from having the understanding to solve the problem, i.e., you need to find a way to go from the first level to the third level. And that is the essence of the plan that the masters were given 13 plus thousand years ago. But here again, you can't go directly from first to the third. You got to pass through this intermediate level called the second level, which is why Thoth introduced writing. Because the act of doing that changed the way we access memory. That changed us from the first level into the second level. And that was the very necessary step that ultimately will enable us to uh, transcend all of our problems, uh, the disaster that was created in Atlantis and all the rest of them. When the day comes, uh, <laughs> many more veils will be lifted. So does that sort of make sense? If not, I'll try and fill in some more blanks. No, you're doing fine, Bob. Uh, uh-huh. Really. Okay, good. One of the things I, when I was reading in your book on page 44, it talked about uh, uh, Drunvalo's brief meeting with Thoth, and uh, Thoth uh, shared with him this information about finding the three missing atoms. And I was yeah, wondering, right. did Drunvalo find the three missing atoms? And if so, <laughs> he, what, what are they? He, he says he did, but uh, he, he, doesn't, he never did share that information. So he was given some sort of an out-of-body experience uh, guided by mm-hmm. Thoth, Okay. that gave him the understanding of what these three missing atoms were. I mean, you know, he was told, well, there's three missing atoms in the universe. It's your job to go find out what they are, you know. So, okay, here Real I go. Small. And, uh, yeah, right, right. Uh, uh, the other thing I want to ask you about was that you, you explain in the book, in this section about Thoth, that he, was, that he came up with this blueprint for a Christ consciousness grid that yeah. uh, exists uh, around the planet. Is this, um, basically, is this manifest in what we call ley lines in these unique special places such as, uh, you know, uh, uh, Sonoma in, in uh, Arizona and uh, uh, Mount Shasta as well as, you know, where the pyramids are located? These special places, you know. Uh, That's right. Uh, is that, is that the physical locations of these, of these special con- Christ That's- consciousness grid points? That's that's uh, that's the essence of it. How we talked the last time or two about how these eighty-three thousand sacred sites were intentionally created first on a fourth-dimensional level and then recreated on a third-dimensional level. Every single one of them can mathematically be delineated back to that single spot in Egypt, back to the uh, to the Giza plateau, and so that's very high level of geomancy, in other words, consciously manipulating the energy on the surface, that had the effect over 13,000 years of creating this electromagnetic energy field above the planet, the grid that will enable us at the appropriate moment to go into this third level of consciousness, this very high level of unity awareness. I think we're going to have to uh, cut it off there, Bob. We were just about at the top of the hour. And that also explains why it is that when people go to these uh, sacred places, um, they are oftentimes uh, surprisingly uh, touched, moved, and inspired. I mean, for some people, it's a life-changing event. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's a powerful energy field. There's, Indeed. There's no doubt about it. I know it. you've been to a few of these places, so perhaps in a, in a future uh, conversation we can talk about those. Bob, thanks so much for being with us. It's always a pleasure to spend an hour with you. Well, uh, I tell you, the pleasure is mine. I just, I really, really look forward to. I mean, I just, it's, it's just, it's just fun. It's just a joy to be on your show. It's, so it's fun for us. Thanks too. so much. Thanks a lot, and have a great weekend. That is our program for this evening, folks. Uh, thanks for being with us. We'll be back next week with more Far Out Radio.